Mid-size sedans are a very classic choice of vehicles. They've been around for decades and still stand for the typical image of a car. Just imagine how you would firstly draw a car as a kid. They can also stand for a brand itself, like it is the case with the BMW. The 3 Series is the core of the brand. For a long time it has been their most sold vehicle and people still connect the image of BMW with the 3 Series. Or, as we say in Germany, the BMW 3er. Nowadays SUVs are massively catching up in sales figures, but for a lot of people a mid-size sedan is still the way to go for when picking a car that shouldn't be too long, but should fit all daily passengers and all daily purposes and still keeps a somewhat elegant and sporty touch. In this episode we'll take a closer look at three of the most famous premium mid-size sedans. The Alfa Giulia as a recent facelift, the all-new generation of the BMW 3 Series and the Mercedes C-Class also facelifted in this very generation. We even have them as comparable performance versions, not the top of the line, but the sporty versions that still represent a compromise between comfort and sportiness. The Alfa Giulia Veloce, the BMW 3 Series 340i, as well as the Mercedes C-Class as Mercedes AMG C43. Oh, and these three are in a way special because they are all rear-wheel driven or optional all-wheel driven with rear-wheel bias. Let's take a look at all these cars, exterior, interior and driving and also tell us later after watching which one is your favorite of these three and why. The Alfa Romeo Giulia facelift. So what has changed with the Alfa Giulia? And also today the Alfa Giulia Veloce S Petrol just here for you. With Thomas and Jonas behind the camera. As you know in exterior, interior and the driving experience. High up the Alps, 2000 meters of altitude. Nice landscape, beautiful car. In full HD, full screen and full length. Let's go. A model year change or an update of a vehicle you also call facelift even though when the face is not being changed and they intentionally did not want to change the face because they said the customers were pretty happy with the face. Well I'm happy that we have Misano blue as the exterior color for today which is clearly a typical Thomas blue here on Autogefühl. Then well one thing they should have brought to this vehicle are LED headlamps. That's missing however they are not starting with halogen anymore. All Julias now get the Xenon headlamps as standard, at least, and then optional, the Bi Xenon, which we also have here right today. Other than that, the typical Alpha design here with the number plate just on the one side, and then typical Alpha grill, beautiful sensual shape also here on the front hood. So, design wise, I think without a doubt, one of the most beautiful ones in the midsize segment. Or what do you think? The length is 4 meters 64, 183 inches or 15 foot 2 and wheel sizes go from 16 to 19 inch and 19 inch is also here what we have today, really massive and also with those contrasting brake calipers. The Veloce badge right here already has a sporty look, you've already seen it in the front, black frames around the windows, so the Veloce version is not the Quadrifoglio which has this 2.9 liter V6 engine. But this one here already with more horsepower soon to those engines and of course the sportier look here in the Veloce trim. And there's also a Veloce TI available and they differ a little bit as for the features they come with. There's an adaptive suspension available which we also have today and the general design is pretty simple in the side profile here with a round shape then there's a dropping line at the height of the door handle 
and well a quite coupe like sedan shape here as for the window profile we could not deliver you the car all clean today it's not possible in those road conditions but i think it still looks quite fancy doesn't it well, the Alfa Giulia is not an all-new car, but I think they really managed to keep up a timeless design. Also here with those quite elegant tail lamps. Q4, the logo then for the all-wheel drive. But this model here is also now available with rear-wheel drive only. Soon more deals to that. In the lower part, we have a more aggressive diffuser in the Veloce. And those outer tips here are just for beauty. The real exhaust tips are on the inside, but they look somewhat the same. They're just a little bit smaller. So what do we have under the hood? First of all, in general for the Alfa Giulio, there's a 2.2 liter diesel available with 190 horsepower, optional all-wheel drive or 210 horsepower, always all-wheel drive. And then this one here, the 2 liter four-cylinder turbo petrol engine, either with 200 horsepower and rear-wheel drive or with 280 horsepower, now also available with rear-wheel drive and optional with all-wheel drive, the one we have here today, all-wheel drive, 280 horsepower. And then in the quality folio, we get the 2.9 liter V6 with 510 horsepower. But this one here already, the 280 horsepower and then 5.2 seconds is the acceleration figure. That's already quite decent. The smaller petrol engine would have 6.6 .6 seconds as the acceleration figure. So that would already be enough, actually. If you have a rear drive only, you're a little bit more flexible. You will have a more narrow turning circle here with the all-wheel drive model. The wheels don't turn in so much. So you have to think about what's more important to you. I think when you can get a car as rear-wheel drive, probably take it as rear-wheel drive. And the low horsepower spec will also be just fine. But the driving experience then today with this one, looking forward to that. And I think the engine cover and, you know, the whole setup here looks already quite promising, doesn't it? car key it's pretty thick actually it makes a good quality impression however it might be also pretty thick then in the pocket that would be the disadvantage keyless entry here when pressing the knob too close to the vehicle or put your hand on the inside to open it door closing sound yeah quite solid then soft materials at the inside of the doors in the front and a fancy door handle right there you also some you know spiced up door buttons but that's nothing new here for the facelift we also have the optional sound system in here which is you know quite decent from the sound then a new steering wheel that's one of the major changes so the whole steering wheel is new and also the steering feel so we'll later talk more about that in the driving part upgrade assistance systems for example here for the cruise control the levers and here also for the active lane keeping assist so now more towards level two autonomous driving and keeping up with the competition that's nice you see here the shifting panels they are separated from the steering wheel and pretty large then we have those round turbine style vents also soft touch of the dashboard seating there are sport seats that coming with the Veloce version, both Veloce and Veloce Ti. The Veloce Ti, by the way, would standardly come with Alcantara on the middle part, at least in European markets. The choices really depend on the market. For example, in the US configurator, I could only find animal skin, like we see here at the moment. Especially in European markets, Germany, for example, you get a fabric seat, full fabric. You get a fabric leatherette mix, which would be also cool. So fabric inside, leatherette outside. And then also, as I said, here with the Alcantara. So you have to check out which options are available on your market. Or maybe just ask your Alpha dealer for that. Of course, we can recommend a fabric seating choice. And it's, or the Alcantara that is a little bit warm in winter. Now it's really cold already here. And of course, also a little bit cooler in summer when you don't have the slick seating choices. And also comfort-wise, by the way, so those... um no matter if it's now like animal skin or the leatherette, when you have the slick surfaces, they're also a little bit stiffer as for the very surface. When you have a fabric or Alcantara surface, it adapts a little bit more to your body and, you know, 
to you to your bones, you know, in, in in your lower body and so on. So it's also more comfortable. But in general, it's actually quite a nice seating position. Mm, again, maybe on those animal skin seat, not maybe on the long run when you have like four or five hours or so. Um, but so far, first impression is actually quite good. Also very soft here from the head restraint. That's cool. Headroom wise, one meters eighty six or six foot one. That still leaves enough headroom right there. No problem. There's no panoramic roof in this very vehicle, but of course there's one available. Then steering wheel can be adjusted quite a lot in height and also in reach, like this. And you always get this very sporty Alpha cockpit here now where the gauges, those classic gauges, are put in very deeply. This is always something emotional to look at them directly when you start the vehicle. And you do start it right here with the start, stop, engine knob. And we're going to into details now about the news of the infotainment system. First of all, last comment here to the seat. The lower area can be put a little bit longer and this is also electric seat control. We can also put the seat a little bit higher and also the back part of the seat. But my, my favorite is really like this very soft head restraint. It's like, hmm, like for a nice nap in between, hmm, might not be, be too bad. We see a lot of decent interior quality. But, however, one thing that is not that well done is here, the opener for the front hood is like this whole area here. There you also um, open the you know, the hatch in the rear, but here this one is like, I mean, not sure what they thought about that. Maybe that they, you know, don't open the hood that often, but when you have Alfa Romeo, you maybe want to show the engine off to your friends from time to time, so that should be a little bit, you know, more resonating to the rest of the interior quality. Now to the interior overview, we see here a very sensual form and soft touch materials again, that is very nicely done. Here also in the lower part, so good build quality as we see here. Then the screen is actually quite well integrated in this dashboard, so more details to that. What's new is either you get a new 7 inch screen, so it's a little bit smaller than the, like the, the screen part of the whole panel, or this new 8.8 .8 inch and this here is also touchscreen now. So that's big news, so to say. So far, only with the controller in the lower part, now you have the choice with the bigger one. So either touch or then using this lower control knob. And again, zoom more details to the infotainment system. Then the steering wheel view right there. Again, completely new steering wheel. It looks more modern, also feels a little bit better. Right side volume control, for example, or picking up the phone. And on the left side, then from the cruise control, told you that already earlier. Those instruments, again, fancy because they have this sporty style, left side typical analog meter, right side for the speed. And what's also cool is when we do a start of the vehicle, then the arrows go all the way to the right end and then back to the left again. And in the middle part, you have a digital screen, for example, um, you can get some information on uh, fuel economy right there. Yeah, wait a minute. So I have to start the car for that. Here we go. So, and then we can... And interesting is, I'll give you a more decent fuel economy figure when running straight later. But here at the moment, when we're going uphill, we're already at about 15 liters. And the funny thing is, it doesn't go any th any more above that. So obviously... Yeah, you know, when there's more like 15 liters uh, of fuel, uh, fuel consumption per 100 kilometers, we just say it stays at 15. So we don't show like 16, 17, no, just 15 maximum. <laughs> nice idea, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but you can also get a nice digital speedometer in, in the middle part, or for example, also some assistant info information. And here again, to see how the shifting pedals, they stay just where they are, even if you move the steering wheel. So, and what else to this interior? We have on the other side, we have the climate unit. And this is actually quite good because you can still control them while driving. And also you get quite good quality right there, here for warmer and colder, and also for the vent strength. You also have a heated steering wheel option, of course, and heated seats. And in the lower part here, there's one USB supply, USB-A, that also works for the connection to Apple CarPlay or Android Auto. 12-volt power supply with a nice metal knurling around. And then you have some sp space here in the front for a smartphone that works. Adaptive cup holders. And then there's a completely new middle console, also with like a you know checkered structure right there. That feels good. 
you have a new shifting lever that's new as well that also with an Italian flag <laughs> yeah nice then you have a classic volume knob and this round pressing turning knob this one is also new the previous one was a little bit loose so to say when you did like you know something like this here now you can move it up and down right left but also turn it and this one feels better now better quality and a hotkey to go to the home menu and as well as an option and then when you lift up this middle console right there it's yeah it could be maybe a little bit better attached but still quite okay then you open it and you have now new and inductive charging platform for your smartphone there's also a cable connection here and that is going to the usb-a or also now the usb-c if you like and those ones are also for connecting to the smartphone interface so infotainment system first of all the sound of this harman kardon system and yeah, it's actually quite decent so like that so i would you know as a music lover probably also go for this option then you have this new main menu so different you know app views so to say you can also go to a climate menu but since everything is menu in the lower area i'm not sure why we would need that exactly then I can go back to the home menu and look at the car internal GPS and it looks a little bit dated but the good thing is that it's quite responsive so that's actually quite okay so this would be one possibility the other of course to now you can see you can also use it with touch you can also drag and drop to reorder those widgets but um, this I'm not sure why this function is so prominent in the menu there you always try to click oh that's the home menu no it's not the home menu but it's it's for reordering everything and then you can go to the apple carplay that's better integration now it goes all the way in the widescreen format looks like this and then you can always go back to the alpha menu right there so i think we can really say that with this facelift interior quality definitely improved but one strange thing i found here is when you move the main mirror i mean you can normally move that you know but when you do it with one hand especially you know like what's this you know i mean it's not that it's not properly attached but to this side it does move to the other side you know not but when you put it to the left side then it goes like this so you have to like hold it tight and then just move it like with two hands strange function right you know like almost like um you know like when something is not supposed to break on you know motorcycles on the outside like levers or something that they uh you know give way a little bit but here not sure what this function is meaning well and the screen has been updated but the rear view camera clearly not because the resolution of the rear view camera is yeah i mean okay yes it's also dirty now um because of this snowy en environment but uh, still we have a camera wise and also the brightness it delivers mm, not so much things you can see there but it's still good to have it well guys i always have been a fan of alfa romeo design on the exterior but there's a catch <laughs> yeah the space on the interior first of all look at that and we do have soft touch material also on the rear doors that's cool good quality as for that not sure what kind of beverages you should put in here maybe like you know small glasses with um you know smoothie for babies uh, i don't know <laughs> that's the only thing it's probably suitable for and then the design again is quite nice but you already see that the whole area here right is pretty thick so there's hardly much space to get in and also the leg room as the seat as i have put it at the moment when i'm driving as a rather tall driver yeah and then let's try to get inside shoe tap of course for the snow and yeah i mean somehow it does fit but yeah i'm already um hitting the back here with with my knees and headroom wise also maybe directly fits but yeah so legroom is pretty much cramped and that's also mm, you know if you compare it to other competitors in the segment rather yeah rather bad definitely you can get along somewhat but not that well so that's not the strength of this car um also the bench here is quite short and so on yeah that's it However, we do have isofix at the outside seats, so maybe more suitable than for child seats. And then there's also this middle armrest with um, some adaptive cup holders. And since we are in a skiing region here at the moment, we can also just move the middle part down here 
as for a ski hatch function. And here in the back part of the middle console, not only again the nice turbine vents style, but here two more USB supplies, USB A and also seat heating. But of course, that's again an option. And you can see this big middle tunnel here. Of course, it's a rear wheel drive car and you know, or all wheel drive optionally. And so in the middle part, there's no space whatsoever for legs. Now to the trunk right there. And of course you're limited as for the sedan building style right there, but you know it goes actually quite long in there and that you have a better impression. I can also put a backpack inside. So height wise this does still fit, yes. And some measurements. So the width here is less than a meter, so a little bit less than a meter in width. The length is also a little bit less than a meter. And the height here is 47 centimeters. You have to unlock the seats from here, like this, and then you have to go around to the rear compartment and flip them. Or with the earlier shown ski hatch function, you can just put the middle part down, so that would also be possible. You can get them a little bit flatter if you would put up the head restraints, so that would be possible. And then we have here a maximum loading length to the driver's seat, as I would be driving, of 173 centimeters. Welcome! <laughs> So that was acceleration to 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour and starting in a slight curve with this all-wheel drive, a little slippery from the road surface. So we had you know some sliding out in this D mode, this dynamic mode. And although it is all-wheel drive, you know, we had a slight rear drift, and that shows you that it does have a rear wheel bias. Pretty cool, right? And also thanks to the all-wheel drive you could get all the grip to the ground. That was of course pretty cool. So yeah, the all-wheel drive does have advantages, definitely. Of course, you know, when you're living in the, you know, those alpine regions here, um, then it might make sense. Other than that, it also comes with disadvantages, yes. If you think about for example, a turning circle. So when you have this version, which is now available, also in the 280 horsepower version with rear wheel drive, you can turn the front wheels a little bit more in, you know, to, to both directions, therefore reduce turning circle and the car maybe feels a little bit more agile. Then again, the question is if you need the all-wheel drive for uh, like, you know, winterly conditions and so on, that might make sense. And I mean, acceleration here 5.2 seconds when you're going just straight to one kilometer or so 62 miles an hour. And, and there's no, you know, no figure for the rear drive model yet. We have to check that out later. Um, of course, this car can also bring serious traction to the ground just by the rear wheels. It's also, you know, planned as a rear wheel drive car from, from beginning on. But then again, as soon as it gets slippery, like now, you know, was like with dirt on the road and so on then the all-wheel drive really has a big advantage. Whew. Wow, that was <laughs> a pretty cool thing. Um, by the way, when we are in this dynamic, um, this you know, sporty mode, then we can, when we have, you know, still want to have some more comfort, we can click on this suspension button here in the middle console, and then we have the soft dampening. So you stay in this sporty mode where the gears are turned up higher. Yet again, you have a softer dampening, like in the normal modes. This, um, you know, this can indeed make sense, you know, why not? So I think I, I really, really fancy that. And when you're driving, you know, in city traffic and so on, then you usually would go to the normal, the N mode, or then to the A mode, I think it was called advanced, advanced efficiency or something. So that does the exact opposite as the sport mode, so it reduces the throttle input, Yes, are turned up a little bit lower, earlier upshifting and so on, and in the D mode, then this sports mode, 
later shifting up and so on. So depending on what you want to have and um, yeah, how you want to have more or less fun or about the fuel economy, of course. Yeah, talking about fuel economy, the lowest fuel economy I could score here was about 10 liters or more kilometers, you know, like 23 MPG US, 28 MPG UK. And that was really rather, you know, trying and yeah. <laughs> so you rather should expect even worse fuel economy. And that's probably also one of the things here um, about this vehicle that won't work that well, you know, to, to score a good fuel economy. Well, and since we come to a stop here, we can go back to this D mode and um, just, you know, accelerate out this traffic light. Of course, sound wise, yeah, you know, four cylinder, not too much coming there. So, yeah, I mean, it's okay, but it's nothing that would be um, really emotional. But this car has some serious power, definitely. And especially when you're on this D mode, the throttle input is that crisp that you just slide you on the throttle and it, it jumps forward. You can always use the shifting pedals as well. They are fixed to the steering wheel, so they do, do not move alongside. Some say that's better. Others say that's worse. Hmm. Me personally, I prefer to have them on the steering wheel uh, because you know when you're sometimes turning them, you know, turning the steering wheel, then you you know hit the, the pedals. You have to get used to that. You really um, you know stay close with your hands and then only reach out when you really need it. And they give a good feedback. Nice clicking sound as well. So that's also. A lot of fun, definitely. Yeah, click, click. <laughs> well, we can also use them a little bit better and we can show you some agility. And this car really behaves very well, well, very, really, very neutrally balanced, like that. And it is, yeah, it is a little bit more loose, so to say, than some of the competitors. A little bit more aggressive, not that stable as for the grip. Of course, the road here is somewhat wet, yes, but that's also how this car is um, meant to be. Of course, we have tracked from the all-wheel drive in this case here when we accelerate out, but the car is definitely a little bit more challenging to drive than the German premium manufacturers, they like the, you know, the, the mid-size models of those. But that's probably also a thing why you would go then for the Alfa Romeo in this case. Yeah, a lot of fun to use the shifting pedals here. And one thing I found best with the facelift now is the steering does indeed have more feel. So one of the major upgrades is new steering feel. Not only the steering wheel, but also the steering feel. So before it was, mm, let's say, very direct and precise, yes, but without precision, you know, and it felt only arcade-alike, like in a computer game and, you know, with, without any contact to the road. And that has improved now, definitely. So I feel more connected, driver, car and road, that works very well. So in this D mode, let's see if there's any difference to the N mode in, in steering. It's here, here now. Back to D mode. Yeah, it gets, gets a little bit stiffer. And I like that, especially in the D mode when it's a little bit stiffer as for the steering feedback. That's good. Yeah, pretty good in the acceleration. You can also check out the speed. And it's a lot of fun to drive this car, definitely. So, yeah, I, I would say it's definitely among the most fun mid size vehicles. This petrol engine also more fun than the diesel. I had the diesel, I think, like a year ago or something. And you guys also want to request a petrol review, and so that's why I'm delivering it to you right now. And of course, when you have the chance, just gonna mention it again, to buy such a petrol mid-size sedan, I would go for the uh, rear drive one. 
unless you really need um, you need it somehow like uh, in those regions here. So wow, enjoy this here together with me. Cars really somewhat loose. I mean, <laughs> not that much grip on this road. It always depends also on the tires, definitely, and of course the conditions, road, and so on. But I really have to be a little bit careful here. You feel that as well, Jonas? That we. <laughs> yeah, slide a little bit. It's very, very interesting, definitely. So be careful, guys. Yeah, the road is a little bit wet, so um, always watch out for that. Those 19-inch wheels, by the way, comfort-wise, you do feel them, of course. So especially when we're going over some bumps and in this D mode, it can get a little bit rough. Then again, when I set the soft dampening, that definitely helps. So I can recommend that you don't lose the feeling for the car when you have the soft dampening active, you just have a little bit more comfort. I think that's also the reason why they introduced it here, that you can still set it in a sports mode. So very good decision that you can have a little bit more sporty acceleration, yet again you remain with the suspension comfort and that's I think that's quite cool definitely. So suspension wise there's this adaptive suspension available for the Alpha Julia and I would also recommend pick that to increase the comfort. So far I think when you are in the soft mode it is a quite good compromise. When you're in the normal dynamic mode then yeah it can get a little bit rough for everyday driving situations. It might be fun then when you have countryside roads which are very very well built then you get the suspension a little bit stiffer. You can enjoy that one a little bit more. As for noise insulation no complaints there. I mean, we were also driving one kilometers or 62 miles an hour, and this was actually quite fine, so it wasn't too loud. No chance to drive on the German motorway today because we're in Austria, so we cannot comment on like 160 kilometers an hour noise insulation or something. For most markets, it will anyway be more relevant this 100 kilometers or 60 miles, how that one behaves then. And definitely also a beautiful landscape ride for you once again. Hope you also enjoy that together with us that we can give you nice car things and also nice landscape things at the same time. Um, here by the way, bing bing bing, why? There are new assistance systems built in this vehicle, they have been massively upgraded. Blind spot monitor is also in, the, um, in this car when the yellow triangle is flashing. Here the lane departure warning when I'm getting too close to the middle part and there's also new adaptive cruise control built in here, which is also with this vehicle. And they claim level two autonomous drive. So there is also separate gauge for that. And this, you know, and there's instruments right there. So there we are. And so you can set the adaptive cruise control. It's keeping the distance to the car in front of you. And then when the road is allowing that, you know, when you have a straight road or motorway, for example, tested that earlier, then the car is also kept in lane actively. So when you're getting you know, closer towards the side here, activate or deactivate it here with the steering wheel symbol at the left side of the steering, but at the moment it's not green. So at the moment car tells me, this is probably a road where you should steer yourself. So it doesn't clear the assistance system, so to say. Um, but again, I had a road earlier where that did work, just a straight road. And then it was also quite flawless, so slightly uh, counter-steered than when I was coming to the side of the road and was keeping me in the lane. So good that they also found some upgrades there. It's always important to have those assistance systems, especially as for the blind spot monitor. So. Indeed, I mean, some model year upgrades or facelifts, they do, do not change too much. It's also not like a super, super major upgrade what they've done here. But I think, especially assistance systems, this helps. And of course, my favorite feature is definitely that they brought more feeling to the steering wheel. You know, they also gathered the feedback there from, from the reviewers and also from, from the customers. And I think that's really a very good decision. The car was fun to drive before. But now, to me, it's more, even more fun to drive because it feels more natural at the very same time. So you can enjoy a cozy driving feeling. It's silent enough, noise insulation-wise. At the same time, it's one of 
um, one of the mid-sized vehicles that tells you most drive me drive me now and keep continuing that <laughs> so really enjoying that ride definitely a little bit more fun with the petrol mm, yeah I mean probably would go for the rear-wheel drive then model to have maybe a little bit more fun mm. but then again especially when you have a 280 horsepower version yeah when the roads are a little bit slippery be careful with that the electronic stability control with this vehicle is not too strict <laughs> as we already felt so uh, you have to be you know, able to drive such a vehicle with uh, such horsepower figure and rear-wheel drive then I think the most clever pick will be the base petrol engine with rear-wheel drive because it is the same displacement and one of the rules also to keep your engine let's say you know in good shape over a over long, over longer period of time biggest displacement but lowest horsepower figure version that's always good because then you know the engine is not tuned that high not so much stress on the engine so my pick would definitely be the petrol engine with the smallest horsepower figure and then you have something very agile but which is still suitable to the car um, here I mean you have abundance of power it's not really needed so I would also be happy with less power in, in this vehicle but definitely of course when you saw the very first acceleration yeah that was already a lot of fun so nice upgrades here with the facelift and still a very enjoyable ride with the Alfa Giulia what do you think And now to our conclusion for today with the Alfa Giulia Veloce as a facelift. Well, indeed, the face has not been changed. And I think that's also quite okay because it is such a beautiful vehicle, I think. Please tell me also your opinion. Well, yeah, it could have used some LED lamps, definitely. But the bi-xenon lights, they already give you quite some lighting performance. At least the halogens are completely gone now then on the interior improved build quality at some stages especially in the middle console that makes a better you know impression now definitely and i mean it's not a cheap brand you have to calculate about 37 to the maximum about 60,000 euros for the julia and you know, of course also you now compare it in us dollars so that should also be you know at the top of the game also as for the interior build quality We've seen some flaws are there, yes, but mostly not in parts which you would use in everyday uh, driving life. So I think that's also quite okay. And as for this respect, also good to have this new steering wheel, both for the visual part and especially also for the steering feeling because it's more natural now. And, you know, before I had some situations when I were going a motorway with the preface of Julian, um, I mean, it's... It, it has good reaction but then you were like driving really fast and just a slight steering response like, like oh whoa <laughs> but that's definitely better now so i think this is also one of the most significant changes well as for the engine here with the orbit drive model a lot of power here and also more traction to the ground of course personally i would go for the best price performance deal i always advise that one to you Go with the smallest petrol engine with rear-wheel drive only. Have a little bit smaller turning circle because here with the all-wheel drive, yeah, it really has a turning circle like a tractor. So um, that's definitely a big disadvantage. And also the fuel consumption is way too high with this car. That might also be a little bit better with the lower horsepower trim of the petrol engine. And also if you do not have all-wheel drive, this can also improve the fuel economy there a little bit. And the seating choices, at least in European markets, we have quite good choices. So my favorite would actually be um, uh, Julia Petrol, here also in Misano Blue with rear-wheel drive, and probably those fabric leather red seat mix on the interior. That would be my configuration tip for today. And then you can get... Um, anyway, check out how close you can get to this one in your market and also maybe give me your favorite configuration there in the comment or if you're already an existing alpha julia customer please tell us your feedback 
what have you experienced with your car pro and con so it's always good to have the real customer feedback here also in the comments we can learn from that and of course also new potential buyers as well so what do you think about the alpha julia facelift here and especially in the veloce trim today the m340i is most sold in the us and canada well what about this six cylinder petrol engine and all of the exterior and interior features of the m340i here on Autogofuel, as you know, full HD, full screen and full length. Let's go. That's 100 already, wow. Please subscribe to us if you haven't done so far. Here the all new BMW 3 Series is a little bit wider than the previous generation and here this M340i has special cerium gray, that's how they call it, color here around the double kidney and also this mesh style grille. So yeah, that looks really sporty, also a sportier lower bumper and the headlamps, they come standard as LED optional you can get adaptive leds and optional optional the laser light which you can also see here as we have those blue accentuations and a modern daytime running light overall quite sporty already in the front and the color here for today is tanzanite blue so it's a very dark one but with special brighter nuances depending on how you look and how the light comes very beautiful i rather like screaming out thomas blue colors but this one also pretty elegant isn't it so I recently heard there was a drinking game when you watch Out of Food with Friends if I walk in from the front actually like this or if I come in from the rear, so from which side. So if you're <laughs> watching Out of Food as a group, yeah, that's a cool drinking game, you know, whatever you want to drink. So, but now clearly with the side profile, let's begin with the length of 4 meters 70, 15 foot 4 or 185 inches. And that's actually 8.5 centimeters longer than the 3 Series predecessor. Here, of course, the M340i. It's no different. Classic sedan shape. And I can also announce to you that the M340i will also be available as the Touring. That will then be most important for Germany and the UK. This one here is sedan, predominantly then, for example, told you earlier, for the US and Canada, and also pretty famous in Australia, for example. South Africa as well. Then, cerium gray accentuations here also at the side mirrors. Very beautiful M logo, because this one is the M performance model. You remember, the M performance model are, so to say, the M light variants, and the true M models then, you know, with even more power. Then, 18-inch wheels would be standard for the M340i. It's always coming m340i yeah <laughs> but i'm doing my best yeah doing my best here really then 19 inch wheels those ones are the ones you can see here that is even an option for this model here but you always get bigger brake discs to have a little bit more performance here also with the blue accentuations very beautiful then again you can see how the designers played a little bit with light and shadow here brighter color then from this tense night blue on the top part then the dropping line then it's darker again a little bit and you have those glossy black frames around the windows to have this sportier or this more aggressive look so do you like this model here or would you prefer another three series also in the rear the m340i for us rather elegant sporty style so not too much attention to everything in general, the new 3 Series has those horizontally drawn tail lamps, so where you see this new generation... Oh, yeah, that's the new 3 Series, is mainly the tail lamps, if you compare it to the predecessor. Then the M340i gets this additional small lip there in the vehicle color, and the cerium gray accentuations in the lower part. Then those beauty tips here on the outside, the real exhaust on the inside. 
two pipes and interesting is that they split very early in the whole exhaust system to make it more efficient and also you know to increase the performance yeah what do you think about the first sound taste you heard there in the intro which Jonas has done also very interesting definitely here and xDrive logo because clearly this is not rear-wheel drive this is all-wheel drive but with a rear-wheel bias for the new 3 Series, you can get 2-liter 4-cylinders and 3-liter 6-cylinders, both petrol and diesel. There's also the new 2-liter petrol-based PHEV, but this one here, a true 6-cylinder petrol engine, 3-liter of displacement, and here with 374 horsepower in the M Performance model 3. 40i m340i acceleration figure is 4.4 seconds to 100 kilometers or 62 miles now as sedan or 4.5 then as touring because the touring is just a little bit heavier but you know you won't feel big of a difference x drive so the all-wheel drive with rear wheel bias so you should still get you know quite sporty out of the corners we'll see how that one plays out in our driving part really looking forward to that slim and light and the M colors here at the side of course also keyless entry available when you put your finger just here on those you could call them also vortex generators <laughs> those three lines well not really but they look like it and then put your hand on the inside to open it door closing sound yeah that sounds quite solid like that then inside of the doors also soft and plush materials here on the top Hofmeister King design element also at the inside of the doors all buttons galvanized so high quality also place for some reasonable bottles right there optional Harman Kardon sound system so that gives you nice sound M340i entry batch and also sporty aluminum pedals together with the M sport steering wheel which can also be heated yay nice function for the winter time BMW live cockpit means they also come with the all digitalized stuff left and right soon more deals to that and seats, those ones here are the optional animal skin seats, but as a base M340i, you would get a nice mix of sustainable sensor tag leather red and on the inside some Alcantara. I would also go for those ones if you have it available in Germany and most European markets, they are available. Stick with those that you get as base. And the equipment might depend from market to market, market which you can actually get. But in all cases, you will get already sportier seats than with the base 3 series versions however they are not necessarily less comfortable the seating form is sporty yes they hold a little bit tighter but they still offer decent comfort also for taller people i'm one means 86 or six foot one yeah if you have subscribed you know that if not you know it right now <laughs> no. and there's still plenty of headroom left there are also panoramic roofs available for the 3 series this one here without one. So nowadays, a lot of manufacturers equip the test vehicles without one because then you can show like what's the maximum headroom and so on. Um, yeah, depends on. But a lot of people like the panoramic roofs. And when we have the possibility to show them, we always do. Then steering wheel, manual control, but, you know, pretty easy and cool function and very well adjustable. The steering wheel also with the pedals right there to be able to shift because this one is only available with the automatic uh, gearbox eight speed converter automatic gearbox but since you can do the manual shifts right there you can still drive it in a very sporty way left side of the steering wheel set the cruise control and yeah those are not those cheap rubber um, buttons here anymore this is now hard plastic but it feels actually better than the, than the soft rubber stuff you can set the distance in here, optional ACC, the adaptive cruise control, also with this highway pilot pilot mode. Depending on the market, you now it works more or less. It just depends on the regulations. A car can do more than some of the regulations allow in some markets. And on the right side, you can use the voice command. If you don't say hello BMW, just click this button or pick up the phone and so on or adjust the volume. That about the steering wheel. Let's check out more about this whole cockpit.
this is the interior overview. Most of the stuff is just special to the new 3 Series and not exactly for the M340i. Of course, a little bit more stuff you have already included, like the BMW Live cockpit. So left side, 12.3 inch digital instruments. Two more deals to that. Right side, 10.25 inch screen right there, horizontal style, and everything's really crystal clear to read. Pretty amazing. Soft touch at the top, top of the dashboard. Optional head display, also zoom, me, zoom on deal to that. Again, this M Sport steering wheel with a nice grip. And also a lot of controls we also told you earlier. Then on the right side, we also have this separate climate unit still. What I don't like is that you don't have the AC button to put it on and off. So you can only put it off completely like this and change the temperature. But then for the AC, you have to go for the AC menu and then go here in the screen for AC on and off. So that's a little bit annoying to me. Zoom on it to that screen. First of all, the rest of the interior here, metal knurled knob for the volume still, but you can also control at the steering wheel. Then this aluminum mesh this is pretty cool because then you don't have so much high glossy black elements in the interior. Slides open then you have an inductive charging pad for your phone if you like. USB A charger and and then the adaptive cup holders, 12 volt power supply. Then this sporty shifting lever for the automatic gearbox. Then you have a camera button, separate one, start stop engine, driving modes. We'll test those ones when we drive the car. And of course, this classic metal knurled turning and pressing knob for the infotainment system with some hotkeys. And you can also write some addresses on here if you don't want to use the voice input. And then this armrest, you can put it up and it's really very well, well attached and USB-C underneath with some storage. Infotainment system up close. That's the main menu. You can also go to the GPS and it looks like this. And this is pretty responsive and I really like the software they are using also clear to read and also guides us always in the right direction. And again, the hotkey to go back to the map or the main menu in the lower middle console, that's always possible. Phone either via Bluetooth or wireless Apple CarPlay. Sometimes it takes a while to connect it, but then it's there and you can very well use it here. See the integrations also all the way all over. Then this optional sound system does actually a very decent job and it's a good surround sound. Wow, crystal clear, very crisp, very nice. Wow. Oh, I just want to listen to some music now. <laughs> okay, we'll just continue to review for a second. So go back to the Carpet menu and here go back to the BMW menu. And of course, voice command is interesting. They at the moment put it to Hello BMW. Drive me to Berlin. Okay, I've selected Berlin. Is this our new destination or shall I have it as intermediate destination? So then you can use this one as a, for the guidance. And we can also just um, press the um, the voice button at the steering wheel. You don't always have to say hello BMW. You can also change the temperature while driving. But of course, to me, it's easier just to use the buttons. But those are just some um, examples what you can do then with the voice activation. and. Um, you know, it's also possible if you don't use that one, you can also just type in the address manually or you can use this writing pad then here to go for some <laughs> drawings or you can, of course, type in the letters for the address. So that's, you know, um, used. You can just pick what you like best. And what's also interesting is when we go to the car menu, um, we have, for example, here for, for driving information. Oh, there's also a blue car in here. That's cool that they pay attention to those. You have sport displays that you can check the G-forces while driving, for example. And what's also very interesting, what I always wanted to try is when you go to car and settings, and then you can go to the general settings, general settings, and then you have the activation word, but also a personal activation word you can set. Start recording. Please tell me the name of the activation word that you want to use to start the voice input in future. Hey, Mercedes. Super. I've saved my personal activation word. <laughs> so uh, let's try that. <laughs> oh. Hey, Mercedes. 
<laughs> okay, yeah. I had to do it at once. So, see, even that works. But you can also just um, name your car, maybe or the name of your wife or whatever, or your husband. So you're free to go with the whatever. And then you can maybe even form a better relationship with your car. And as long as they have that feature, I want to show it. Yeah, those BMW wings. I love this style at the headlamps. Now for puddle light, it's still available from the outside um, when the car has that. And of course, here on the inside, on the well, it's just so cool to look at. Instruments, those digital ones like this, pretty clear to read and also easy as for the orientation. In the middle, there's then space for the GPS info, for example. You can also get those in there. And there's also the reason why the RPMs go counterclockwise. And if Jonas wants, he can also rev it up a little bit. Whoa, yeah, way to go, Jonas. Head up display is a good option. You can see the speed, the allowed speed. It's not flickering in real life. It's very crisp also when you just look at it with your own eye. And also some GPS directions, even some intersections if you're close to the next intersection. So always good to have that. And when you put in reverse gear, there we have it. The rear camera with those helping lines and a great resolution. And the, the thing we talked about earlier with the cameras on the outside, the fake drone view from above, which is then combined for the rear view camera, front view, and also the side mirror cameras. When you put in D mode, then you have a front camera here, reverse mode, rear camera again, there again you can see. <laughs> it always looks funny when the car passes by. There you can see now how they really set together this picture. Pretty interesting. And the reversing assistant, we've shown that to you in the 8 series review and also in the 7 series review from the facelift. This is very interesting when you go in somewhere, like a very narrow surrounding, and then you can go with this reversing assistant and the car automatically drives back itself because it might be tricky to go back yourself in a very narrow way. It's also an interesting feature. In the rear it's always very interesting how they cut out the glass right here and they also protect it here with a rubber lip. Then right there also soft touch at the inside of the doors in the rear. Yeah I mean it's an expensive car then we can also expect that. Blue contour stitches right there, but also at the seats. Yeah, Jonas also always want to move onto the seats, but you know, here we go. <laughs> so also those blue contour stitches. And do you see this typical three series bench form? So how everything is like rounded in the lower area and the bench goes all the way through. If I remember the E30 of my grandparents, it's the same style. So yeah, some retro form of the rear bench. It's always to me an interesting finding. What about the space we have here? Well, in the predecessor 3 Series, I could hardly sit here. Now the car is a little bit longer, so I can sit here also as a tall adult. Yeah, maybe I could drive with the seat a little bit more upright like this. That it would be a little bit more realistic. It fits, but we have to think about it's not the best package overall. So considering, you know, this mid-size segment here, and it's almost the same with the other competitors, the length is already, you know, considerably. But... The space you have on the inside is a little bit disappointing. Again, it works for four tall adults, but it's also not plenty of space. Headroom, you can also put a hand over my head. That's no problem. So you can also live with that. And it's actually quite cozy in here. Again, not the most comfortable one in the rear here, but you can surely live with four tall adults, as I said. Yay! <laughs> the seat belts also with the M colors. That's a nice detail. Then you have Isofix at the outside of the seats each. You have some cup holders right there, also adaptive. And you can also use this one here as a ski hatch, the middle part. The rest then will be flipped from the trunk. And, well, this is all-wheel drive or rear-wheel drive. In both cases, there's a massive middle tunnel. That's typical for BMW. So, yeah, to be able to sit here, you can, you can do it. Um, it's pretty hard then in the middle part. Yeah, you can sit in the middle, but maybe not the most comfortable part and now i have to step over to this middle tunnel good that my shoes are all clean so and now two more usb-c supplies here in the rear if you like and an additional ac unit if the car would yeah we can already see it right here trunk space is at 480 liters but of course if you want to go more flexible then you can take the touring so the estate version 
Well, not in the US and Canada. That's sad. So you stick, you know, you just stick with this one here. Of course, limited as for loading in here. But then they have increased the trunk space if you compare it to the predecessor version. And then the length right here, the normal length is about a meter. And the width as well. So a little bit less than a meter. And the height here, maximum height, is just about 50 centimeters. So that's actually easy to remember and then we can flip the seats to release them right there have to go around ski hatch also possible as I told you earlier other than that like this two-third one-third split like that and then you can also load through longer things and if we go all the way up to the seat as I would be driving let's see what do we have here and that's about one meters and 80 and just that you have a practical image when I put a backpack in here it also fits in upright like this so the sporty version of this vehicle why not putting it in sports mode and see how the all-way drive is rear-wheel biased or not. Hmm, interesting. So, yeah, I felt there's a little bit more power at the rear wheels, but definitely when accelerating out, you feel this all-way drive character because with rear-wheel drive only, the car would have come around with the rear a little bit more. But here I also felt that the front wheels were also pulling me and this is faster, this is better as for the performance, but a little bit less of this rear wheel BMW feel, which is more the, the, the purest BMW feeling. So this one here more on the logical performance side, if you, you know, if you know what I mean. And this, for example, also feels better when accelerating straight out, because again, there's more performance. And here, for example, from 40 kilometers to 100, it already that was one on the ten now. so wow really great in acceleration and then of course if I really hammer it there's even more torque at the front wheels and this is really giving you a great boost and also you know this is quite harmonious feeling because we have this distribution on the wheels steering feel mm, so that was something I have been talking about with the 3 series quite quite some time so here in the low degree you know areas a little bit loose to me and then it increases and gets better in the outside parts so I would like to have a little bit more feeling here you know in the low degree areas and then I would be really happy but overall the steering feel is very sporty and you can do a nice slalom the weight balance is about 50 50 weight equal weight distribution a little bit lower center of gravity here with the new generation they also achieved that of course in general most of the 3 series they drive somewhat the same here in the m340i the standard would be a 10 millimeter lower sport suspension a fixed sport suspension optional also equipped in this test vehicle is the adaptive m suspension that means when i'm here in a sports mode it's a little bit stiffer more contact and reaction from the car and if I go to the comfort mode for example then it's more comfortable so it's indeed <laughs> adaptive as I said and this is also a good choice the fixed amp suspension um, is it's now a little bit rough for everyday driving unless you really desire that so the adaptive amp suspension which is an option even for the M340i is actually a good choice so I would also you know definitely go for that one so one of the options I would even take with this very vehicle and for the launch control we put it in sports mode put it in the, into the D of course then manual shifting mode and then also the additional traction mode and please don't do this at home kits so we just wait until there's no car no traffic whatsoever and then we'll accelerate it out just a little bit for you because that's Good to see here with the all-wheel drive. Brakes all full with left. And 
and that's 100 already. Wow. Wow, that was cool. And safe and collected because of that all-wheel drive. And I mean, at the side there, there was even, you know, like some small cobblestones and so on. So there was a loose ground and still, you know, how well this car accelerated and how stable it was by doing that. That was really amazing. So, wow, pretty impressed. I mean, we had cars that had even harsher performance and so on. But again, this how 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 they could keep this performance in a safe way. You know, that is, I think, the really interesting thing about this car. And then if you think about, yeah, due to this all-wheel drive, it's not the super purest BMW experience. But then again, for most of the customers, this one will be better and safer, you know, when they have great performance, but yet in a, let's say, controlled way. And most of the times, you know, you won't go to the traction mode, leave all the EC in place. So if you are on the street, just a normal um, road, then you leave all those um, helpers active. That's the best thing you can do. And yeah, overall, I mean, you can have a lot of fun with this car, definitely. And here, cruising on the countryside roads is also something, you know, you can enjoy very well. Also in the comfort mode, it's still sporty enough even in the comfort mode. Again, if you have very well, even and you know, well done roads, then the sports mode increases the connection to the road a little bit more even. Other than that, most of the time, I probably will leave it in the comfort mode. And you always have the you know, performance when you want to have it. And you can also use the shifting pedals. Right here, even if you're just, just in a normal driving mode, just use those ones, shift back, and then you have a better acceleration out there. You already heard that. And here again, when you want to cruise through the next neighborhood, the exhaust is not too loud from the outside. If you're in a normal comfort mode, you probably also heard in the sound test where we switched from the normal comfort mode, then to the sports mode, where even in, you know, just, you know, when we're in the, in the, in the uh, idle mode, that even made a difference right there. And here, for example, I don't need to change the driving mode. Safety pedal. And there we are, back with the acceleration again. And that's a lot of fun. And so this car can again, I have to <laughs> stress it again, can combine really both worlds. That's probably pretty cool. And so from all the three series versions I have been driving yeah, this one is definitely among the most fun. It is probably the most sporty fun in a performance way. Then again, with the rear wheel bias, as we had, for example, with the PF, that is definitely very cool if you just have a rear wheel drive. So there's always a temptation if you get a three series to get one with rear wheel drive only, definitely still. And the PF, of course, has this, you know, um, this electric something which makes it more interesting. So. If I could choose, yeah, probably at the moment between those two, either this one or the PF. This one here, of course, are also very, very expensive, so that might be something. Um, and of course, depends on your charging infrastructure. So if you have a charging infrastructure available at the moment, I probably would go for the 3 Series PF. If not, this one here, definitely a fun choice. Again, if it's okay with the money, <laughs> the most basic function, like the good new handling and the good noise installation, also have with the base um, 3 series so I'm always a friend also not to buy the cars super super high and top spec the base function of a car you can also enjoy when you go a lower spec and then also get a more decent price but definitely has also been a fun round with this one here today but we still have some more driving situations here for you to come into some cruising features, everyday driving life. For example, the motorway, we have a blind spot monitor, which is a very important option. There we go with the yellow triangle right there when the car is about to overtake you. Then we also have the adaptive cruise control, even with this highway pilot, which is activated at the moment, it keeps you in the lane. You're supposed to keep your hands on the steering wheel at all times. This is just for demonstration purpose. The re re car really keeps me straight. This is well done, so if I this here, it automatically corrects so that's a quite cozy function and it works you know very smoothly and it also doesn't have 
too many moments where it has low, like those false positives. Yeah, if something goes str very straight for a very, very long time, then maybe, but overall, pretty happy with this system overall. And the autonomous emergency brake, that is of course then standard equipment for a car like this. And also here at 120 kilometers an hour, or about 70 miles per hour, it's actually pretty silent in here, so very cozy. That's also something they have improved here with this new 3 Series generation. And this engine here, if you keep it steady like this, this is also a good example of what would be the minimum consumption. They can score some 7 liters or more kilometers, which would be 34 mbg US, 41 mbg UK. Of course, if you hammer it out a little bit more, then it rather goes like 9 liters, more kilometers, and then lower um, mbg figures, then of course, um, yeah, then something below 30 and of course below 40 and as for the UK figures so it really depends on on you on, on your throttle definitely but feeling very comfortable here on the motorway even at lower speeds and then also the engine is quite silent and in the comfort mode also the suspension is doing a great job so that's the good thing about this adaptive suspension it can actually do both comfort and sportiness depending on what you like and if you have this one here in comfort mode then and you're just cruising it doesn't feel that you would have the attacking 3 series the attacking m340i this m performance model which we then you know had earlier with the acceleration and the handling and so on and that's also what this model is for that it actually is able to do both and you don't have like let's say a bad compromise or so so and that's also what, what i actually like about this vehicle that you still have this sporty elegance and still have the comfort especially here with the adaptive suspension and of course those upgrades here for example as for the noise insulation and so on and also to me maybe a little bit more comfortable than before overall than the predecessor generation so what's really cool this six cylinder on the one hand brings a lot of calmness tranquility if you just you know leave it as it is so really a sovereign experience as I like and then sports mode yeah it gets a little bit bumpier then and then high corner speeds are possible here with 90 no problem in the car feels you know so easy to control and very precise look at that hard on the brakes here then accelerate out again rear wheel bias good sound that was not even all the way through with the throttle so that feels really cool so the car feels very calm and collected yet you have a great performance so i would say what they offer here wow that was tires they hook up great so what they offer here is a safe performance as i would call it you know it's very powerful but it's not exaggerated and the car is very well to control very neutral and balanced in the handling now onto the motorway again behind the truck and so I of course you know overtake that one now I can and that's already it wow lane change pretty stable again and the higher speeds so even if I you know do some steering here at the higher speeds very stable the whole car so I really like that you know so um, it's not an uncontrolled beast. It's very powerful, but you know, you know what you get. You feel that you have this, you, you have a lot of trust in the vehicle, and that's also something where this all-wheel drive, of course, also helps helps to build more trust. So, also different conditions, this car will be very well to control. And now to our conclusion for today with the BMW 3 Series as M340i. Yeah, finally we could do this one here as a full review, also on the road. One of the earliest parts we did with the 3 Series was driving this one here as a prototype on the racetrack, so you should also tune into that review. And also to all the other 3 Series videos we've done, if you, you know, searching for a particular version, or maybe you were just searching for this one, then you were right here. So overall, I think the exterior, yeah, very nice. Probably the nicest ones we've seen today because, uh, yeah, this mesh grill is something very special and it looks a little bit sportier than the other versions. Uh, just, you know, not 
over the top. So still this sporty, elegant look. That's also what I like. What about you? Interior also really refined. If you compare it to the predecessor, they have really stepped up the game in the interior build quality. Also, as standard, you can get those nice Alcantara fabric seats, at least in Europe. CenterTech alternatives are also available in the US and Canada. So overall, also good choice they have here. Head-up display, we can also really see it from the outside. So a lot of elaborate functions you already have here. You don't have to go a segment above to the 5 Series. Already the 3 Series is offering everything you might need. That's today even with the 1 Series with the all-new model that you get all the infotainment features and so on. Driving-wise, of course, that was the most important part for today. Yeah, it's not a rear-wheel drive only model. The X-Drive to get this power to the ground. This is actually... On the one hand, sportier because you have a better acceleration and so on, and you're also safer in, let's say, wet conditions. On the other hand, a 3 Series is more purest when it has just a rear-wheel drive. And I felt that, for example, when driving the P-Half model, which was really fun to drive because it was rear-wheel drive only. And, you know, that's also speaking for a different horsepower variant where you just have the rear-wheel drive. However, still a rear-wheel bias that you still have a sporty feeling here in this car. So if you want, let's say, most performance, but the true M model, which will come at a later stage, is maybe a little bit, you know, too much for you. And this one here even performed as a prototype on the racetrack and was super much fun to ride. In general, in this mid-size segment, the new 3 Series is one of the most fun to drive. That's also why people still go for it. I would also prefer to the big diesel because that is, you know, just a little bit more fun to drive. And the big diesel was also not that you know that good in the, in the fuel economy as i would have hoped so yeah this one is stick, it's still a hot pick especially in the us and in canada the only thing is that especially at this one yeah the price gets really high base price here in germany 60k then if you pick some more extras the car here today 80k wow so 80,000 euros here and that's a tough pill to swallow definitely even though it was a lot of fun to go for this one which three series model would i actually go for so far, every year I have to say that I found the PF very, very interesting. So that would at the moment still be my hot pick. Although, you know, with the color and with the design and the power, this was of course also a very nice ride here today. Exterior, interior and the driving experience. In general, everything you need to know about the C-Class or C-Class as we say in Germany and the C43 performance model here, the Mercedes AMG and will give you a lot of driving fun on the motorway, German Autobahn as well, and winding corners here in the region of the River Mosel. Very beautiful shots. Stay tuned, especially till the end of the driving part. So all the things I'm going to tell you count for all the four different models they have from the C-Class. So the sedan, which we have here today, the coupe, the cabriolet, and also the estate or so-called T model. So four different body styles here in the C-Class lineup. And we'll also have different videos for you now already and also soon to come. Today here the focus on the C43 sedan, which has this new front with the new headlight unit also. The coupe and the convertible always come with LEDs as standard now. 
And this one here is the optional multi-beam LED, which also has the high beam with LED technology for the best light view. And they've also changed the light signature. Also, the front grille has been changed. Basically, everything has went one step up. So the normal AMG line already has my favorite front grille with the diamond pins and one horizontal fin right there. And now the C43, <laughs> it doesn't have it anymore. Now it has the one from the C63 with the dual AMG fin without the diamond pins and the C63 gets a completely new one. Well, I really love the diamond pin on the C43. Maybe I can't buy a C43 now again. I have to maybe go for like C400 or something with a diamond pin grill with the AMG line. Which front grill do you actually prefer? You know, there's even a very classic one with the C-Class with, you know, the, with the top star everyone wants to rip off again. I think it's safer in the way here. And also Hyacinth Red is the exterior color for today. 4 meters 68 or 15 foot 3 is the total length of the Mercedes C-Class sedan. Basically the same also with the other versions. The sedan, of course, with the classic roof shape in the rear and four doors as you can see it. The C43 comes automatically with 18-inch rims. Those ones here are the optional 19-inch AMG rims. You can also see it's aerodynamically optimized. It's a wider shaft right there. This improves the aerodynamics new those wheels here also to the lineup. Pretty spectacular, don't you think so? Then also with a dark cover here for the side mirrors and also around the windows. Overall, it's still a very elegant design. It's not too much. That's what I really like about the C43. Also comes with a bi-turbo Formatic logo. Formatic, why? Well, this one here has the all-wheel drive and is somewhat, you know, the everyday capable AMG model with 30% in the front torque and 70% to the rear. So you still have a rear wheel bias when driving it. And well, they have tuned the engine. I will soon tell you more about the engine and also worth listening, you've um, heard that in the introduction. Let's first continue with the rear. In the rear, the recent product update changed also the tail lights. They now have a different light signature, as you can see. I also have turned it on at the moment. It looks a little bit more modern, definitely. However, biggest difference into the coupe and the convertible is that there you have those horizontal tail lights, which look a little sportier to me than this sedan rear here. So from those four um, different body styles they have, the sedan in the rear is to me the least pleasing one. What do you think? Here the C43 comes with additional small wing lip in a way that it's still elegant and then the big diffuser in the lower part and those four exhaust tips, the outer parts here and you know, the rest part, this is basically just beauty. Well, Maybe it also adds a little bit to the sound, but the real exhaust is, is really way in there behind those tips at all. You get this new key, which is more E-Class style, but matte, well, I like it in a matte way, and it's very slim indeed. Then, towards the doors, let's check the closing sound. Standard C-Class and standard good. Then, on the inside of the doors, a lot of leatherette is being used here in the C43, all soft touch. Then, for example, you can get this matte aluminum style in a sporty way. Seat controls are all there, three memory spots. And with the C-Class face, you can also now get, for example, new wooden inlets. If you like them, you can then, you know, just go for the ones you like. Optional Burmese sound system, pretty decent sound. Also, it's good that you can also put some bigger bottles right there that does fit. And the control for the rear trunk is right there. Then the AMG cockpit is defined by this new AMG steering wheel. It's completely new now uh, with a flat bottom and also with Alcantara at the sides. Me likey, yes. <laughs> and you can see that the column for the Distronic Plus adaptive cruise control is now right here at the steering wheel. So no separate column, but here then the control out of the steering wheel is a little bit easier. 
I will tell you more about then the, those touch pads of the steering wheel later when we see the full cockpit overview. This is interesting here, this, you know, um, spare, this very widely stretched above the cockpit. It's really nice from design. And if we take a look at the seats, basically two seats available, a normal sports seat, which comes standard with the C43, but not this one. This one here is the optional bucket seat. You can see it here, integrated head restraint. And this is also a slimmer seat with more shoulder support, but take my advice and go with the standard sports seats. It, they will offer you more long-term comfort. This one is better for the race track, but who isn't using the car for the race track, then you also don't need to go for this option, can save the money. Also, the standard sports seats come in with an interesting combination of microfiber dynamica on the inside and outside Artico leatherette which is cool this one here has also animal skin leather parts this seat here which is again not necessary but as far as I know if you still want to go for that one but want the Alcantara that should also be possible but to save the money go for the base sport seat you'll have definitely more comfort then still the seating position is quite good it's a mid-size car that also fits my size i feel that i have more comfort with one with 86 or 601 in mid-size cars than in compact cars well of course more always in suvs even if they're smaller depending on an, on the upright seating position then headroom plenty it's no problem when you have the panoramic roof uh, a small one is available here then it will be a little bit less this new steering wheel also has an electric control control right here in the reach on camera it's always hard to con uh, control this seat here because when doors open that's not the natural position usually the door would be closed you can also uh, make that lower part here for example longer or shorter for taller people four bucket seats they're still quite okay but um, I had a chance to test the base seats uh, you know um, at some other stage and they were really better so I can also put the key here just in the middle console and have just free hands here for you and it's actually you know a nice neutral seating position the coupe will have a little bit sportier style for example you can also check a quick review of the coupe also how the view is to the front so the sedan here is really the classic choice also seating wise of course in the c43 is it a little bit lower suspension wise than in the standard c-class so besides the new amg steering wheel here for the amg models the biggest product update change is the infotainment system or the screens in general for all C-Class models. And it starts on the left side with analog gauges and five inch screen in the middle and on the right side with a smaller seven inch screen. And this one here is the maximum setup with 12.3 inch on the left, the all digital instruments. And on the right side then, you get those 10.25 inch screen, a wide screen format, also then with new software. Overall, if you take a look, is a horizontal stress of the dashboard. So here again, it looks a little bit Porsche like even because they wrap everything really tightly. Then with those three characteristic air vents, it looks really stylish and sensual here with carbon fiber decor. But as I said earlier, you can also pick, for example, um, a wood for that if you if you really like. Then let's take a detailed look here at how you interact with those screens as well, because you can still use the common knob, um, but then you also have those new touch pads here, the right one for the right thumb. For example, you can zoom in and out on the map with that, or also go to the home menu of the infotainment system on the right and the left pad then that is for the left instrument cluster there you can for example you know, tra change the view or uh, switch to AMG performance gauges which are exclusively available here you know with boost temperature oil temperature and stuff or just have also GPS information on the left part of the screen I think it's a good solution to control stuff while driving St Still, it's, you know, at some point a little bit complicated how the menu is built up. And one thing also, especially when standing still, it's still no touch touchscreen. Yes, the newest Mercedes MBUX does have that now, but here the C-Class face it does not get that yet. Um, so and it's still a little bit attached on this whole stuff. This will change later. By the way, here you can also connect your phone with classic Bluetooth but also Apple CarPlay is available or Android Auto. 
so um, you can then connect it with the cable in the middle box right there. Then if we take a look at the lower part of the middle console, which is really huge for a mid-sized car, still a classic climate unit to, you know, make it colder or warmer. I think, you know, I like to have this manual control still be able to. Then in the lower part right here, we have a 12 foot power supply and two cup holders, which you could also remove. Then even more lower, the dynamic select, where you can pick the drive modes. I'll talk about the different drive modes when we actually drive the car. And then right next to that is this classic jog, where you can then, for example, do the classic work on the infotainment system if you don't want to use it on the steering wheel. And well, this this one here will be basically removed in the new models. Then not here; it will stay in the C class. But um, I don't see you know big advantage to this this stuff. They they want to have the control that you can control it like a touchpad mouse. So this is another way to control the car. But I, I'm actually never using it. Do you? If you have a C class. And last but not least, this least it's nice middle split opening for the armrest and you see all the clutter you have when you film or when you have smartphones and stuff and of course the smartphone connectivity is in there and mm, that doesn't look so clean so now it looks again very clean <laughs> now let's get to the rear compartment so well legroom wise the seat should be a little bit higher that I can better put my feet under the seat but it's quite okay you can see it's a mid-sized sedan that's not too much but also not little so it's actually okay of course mid-sized sedans are not the ones that use the leg room in, a, in their very best way also it's more a lying seating position here very short bench headroom wise if you have no panoramic roof installed is quite good also works for tall people if you have the estate or the T model then it of course continues more straight to the rear that one will be an advantage other than that it's also nice style with the matte aluminum for the rear <clears throat> the middle seat by the way on special request this is really hard and with the big middle tunnel um, this predominantly rear wheel driven car here in this case all wheel drive has is really almost impossible that someone sits here in, on, the, on the middle seat although it has a third seat belt and is actually you know registered for that isofix at the outer two seats then here you can fold down an armrest some more room right there and cup holders you can also flip the whole thing as a ski hatch like this and then you can load things through the seats itself the seat rears here they have to be flipped from the trunk no, or released and if you want, you also can get a three-zone AC. So in the rear then, you can also have the temperature control for the temperature and the vents if you have rear passengers in a very regular way. Now turn off as the ignition shut off. In the lower part, you just have another storage area. And now to the classic boot or trunk, which has a very funny function, by the way. I mean, it's manual, but then it ultimately flips open with those springs and then you can also do it Homer Simpson style a bit. Trunk closed, trunk open. Trunk closed, trunk open. Trunk closed, trunk open. <laughs> Don't show this to your kids because probably the next time they'll do this all the way around. Well, then we leave it open. And you can see, well, it's not an estate, of course. You cannot load things in that easily, but here, standard cabin trolley can also be put right through. It raises a little bit, so you can use it, yes. That's not the most versatile one. And release of the rear bench is then here and also on the other side. And by the way, below that. Oh my God, it's not painted. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. Actually, I think this is totally okay because who would ever look underneath that? I think we can really say it's okay to save the paint there. Maybe for the environment's, say, uh, environment's sake. <laughs> so here we can load things through you know you have to go then with the rear seats or the ski hatch as i've shown you can also do from the rear passenger compartment i think that's pretty much standard in the segment if you want more then you have to go to the estate and now what's powering this thing 
Ta-da! This is not the one, you know, the true AMG one man, one engine concept. So it's basically works AMG engine, which is produced in a normal Mercedes plant. For the C43, you get this one here, the three liter V6 petrol. Now with 390 horsepower, that's 23 horsepower more than the pre facelift So actually pretty much tuned now. 4.7 seconds to 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour is the acceleration figure. If you want it even faster, then you would need the 4 liter V8 of the C63. So this one here does not get the new inline six yet with the 48 volt board and in the mild hybrid, this one is still rather the classic layout. Before I tell you everything else with driving, let's it's an AMG, so let's floor it out. Not 200 kilometers an hour or 125 miles an hour, that was 100 to 200. 60 miles to 125 miles. Wow. It's almost a driving lounge with the C43 and why don't we start in sport mode here? Hmm, that's a decent sound. Sport plus mode. Wow, they changed that. So that sounds different than the pre-facelift version, definitely. A little bit more powerful. Of course, for the inside of the cabin, all the manufacturers are working with sound enhancers nowadays. Because it's so well insulated, you wouldn't hear so much anymore. Oh, let's get on the motorway. Very good. Side support, basically. Adaptive suspension we have here, so it's not the air suspension, it's a normal adaptive suspension, but as a you know, sporty driver you might also want that more direct feedback. You could say hello <laughs> to the cars <laughs> on the motorway. Wow, precise feedback here from the steering wheel. They have a very natural steering feeling, no tilting of the car at all. And feels really light, basically. The steering itself, by the way, I mentioned it earlier, is really large, so it could be a little bit more compact, maybe. But you have a great grip with the Alcantara sides here, for sure. And you can also switch through those different driving modes. For example, if you're just in a comfort mode, you let the car roll, relax a little bit more. Also, the exhaust is not really noticeable then. Then you can go through the, for example, the sport mode, or then also sport plus. And then the throttle input is adjusted. You add more input then when you just slightly press the throttle, car accelerates. Let's see if that steering also changes. You create stability also at higher speeds. Back to the comfort again. Yeah, wow. The steering is really light then in the comfort mode. So actually for higher speeds, it's basically safer to have the sportier setup than for the, for the steering because it doesn't react so fast then. Otherwise it reacts really, really, really fast. Of course, just for dry roads, there's also a so-called slippery mode then. This is then for you know, rainy conditions when for example, but since you have the all-wheel drive here in the C43, you're always a little bit safer anyway. 30% um, in the front, 70% in the rear, that's the all-wheel drive setup. So you have always some more safety. Um, that makes this car here also the more everyday driving life suitable car if you compare it to the C63. And of course, you do save some money. 
So, after the next hour taking, I'll head back to the right lane and I'll drop down in speed a little bit. So, let's check the flexibility of that engine. Go back to the Sport Plus mode, see what it does from 100 to 130. I like the sound, it's not too much, but I think in a very sonorous, low frequency sound from the six cylinder engine. And you can also induce this, you know, this plopping sound here. Oh, have you heard that? I'm not sure if you can hear it on camera. When you shift down, you're gonna plop, 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 plop. And also when you shift up, of course. And so using the shifting pedal is really fun and you, are, you really get the feeling you are in direct control of what you're doing with the shifting pedals. So that there's basically a direct connection from the shifting pedals to the exhaust. I think this is a very fun thing they have achieved there. And this, by the way, also just in the sports mode. If I would do it in a comfort mode, you can hardly hear anything. And also the shifting transition is very smooth. And when I'm in the sport mode, Really hear that feel different and sport plus is really is again a difference where you can really feel every single detail the car is doing basically pretty interesting so for example you can also then shift down yourself first before the cars shall react and you know the, um, the gear isn't really kept in this mode so if you're at a certain RPM, it shifts up automatically. Let's take a look at this manual mode. We can also press that one. That should actually change it. So if I'm, for example, going back to the third gear now, and then it should not sh shift up. Yeah. And then, this is really interesting. There you feel how the power curve is changing. You know, at some point, there's, there's not more, more acceleration. Therefore, basically, it makes sense to stay so in this at least half automatic mode because you don't need to you know, exceed the RPM limit. It doesn't make any sense. But it's at least interesting that it's there and you can absolutely use it. So a great emotional car definitely for the, for the motorway. Also suspension-wise, the good thing is it is stiff and stable, definitely, but at the same time, it's reasonably comfortable. So this is also to me, because recently, recently we have driven a lot of those compact hot hatches, very sporty cars, sometimes even with better acceleration than this one here. I mean, this one here, even below five seconds to 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour, but for example, recently Audi RS3, even faster than this one here, although it's compact, not this one here, it's mid-size segment. But this one here, the mid-size segment does offer you more comfort for a taller driver suspension-wise. You have a longer wheelbase, you feel they have a little bit more stability on the motorway here. Um, for me, as a tall driver, this is more fun in a way. Well, it's not more agile, more agile is still the compact vehicle because of the shorter wheelbase. But this one here, more fun because you can enjoy more comfort. Those uh, bucket seats, as I said earlier, yeah, I mean, they do a fairly good job in holding you tight and better for the race rig, but again, if you think about adding a little bit more comfort to this vehicle, then you should better stick with the normal sport seats, surface-wise and also from the, from the build-wise. Those seats here are pretty thin. Um, the other ones have just softer bolsters than better for the everyday driving life. So when I played around here a little bit, um, consumption is about 11.5 liters, but I can also just, um, you know, for your interest, give you the minimum consumption figure at, you know, using the cruise control, that's always good to know. So I'm going to the comfort mode and I'll put it to reset. And then I'll also use the cruise control, the Distronic is now mounted here at the steering wheel with a C-Class facelift. So no separate stall column here anymore at the steering wheel. Now I'm at about 120 and we're also going slightly downhill. 
and then of course you can score the lowest consumption figures. We know this a six cylinder engine does not necessarily consume more fuel than some of the very small high tuned two liter turbo, turbo petrol engines for example. So um, it doesn't mean that it is a you know big consumption choice or for saying for example. Of course the mostly depends on what you're actually doing with the vehicle. You know, it's a little bit unrealistic as we go down here, but we we'll soon go up here again and I can tell you something more about it. So, it's also packed with the assistance systems features. So, we have the blind spot monitor. Well, no one is overtaking us at the moment, so nothing will happen in, uh, you know, in this respect. But there will be a red triangle in the side mirror. Then the Distronic Plus is available. It is also available here then with the steering assist that the car keeps itself in the lane. Don't take your hands off the steering wheel, but you see that the car is actually leading the way. It is assisting you, and when I keep my hands off the steering wheel for a too long time, the car will also say, Evil Thomas, please don't do that. It's not safe, as in right now. And then after a while, the function will just stop, and ultimately the car will also stop. So, so keep your hands at the steering wheel. You can also, if you know, don't want this assisting feature, deactivate it at the left side of the steering wheel and then I'm completely free to steer again. And wow, the, the reaction, the feedback that the car gives here also at higher speeds is really, really something amazing. So um, almost feels go kart alike, although we are already at 4 meters 70 in, in length. Uh, what I don't like is this. Um, run off road protection, well, sorry, Volvo calls it that way. Um, when I'm coming, you know, here to the, to the side, the car is warning, yeah, it's good, but I think it would be better if the car would, um, you know, react with a little counter steer. But what the car usually does now at Mercedes, it's using the brakes. Let's see here. No, yeah, it's not doing it. It seems to be a a little bit smoother here in those vehicles than the new ones we recently had. For example, also especially in the new A-Class. Yeah, when you have the steering assist, it does counter see a little bit, but here... Hmm, strange. Now the lane assist doesn't, doesn't really work properly. I'm not sure why. Um, but what we've experienced in the A-Class was the car really hammered the brakes and that was pretty annoying. But this one here, obviously, obviously still an older version. And to me, in this case, a little bit more pleasing. You can still deactivate both systems, then you're free to do whatever. And just, you know, use the Distronic Plus as a cruise control, keeping the distance in the car in front of you. I think sides, um, you know, those um, blind spot monitor and also the Distronic to keep the distance. Those are definitely two features that, you know, really, really make sense. So we drop down with the speed a little bit before the next overtaking maneuver. I can show you also some acceleration uphill. Here we could score as low as 7 liters on 100 kilometers, the lowest consumption figure, cruise control on the motorway. That is theoretically possible, but you know, of course, not a really realistic figure if you take everything in mind. And you know, the high, higher consumption was, you know, at about 11 something, and usually the truth is then something in between. And uh, I'll keep you updated later on what happens, and happens you know, in, in the full time we drive this car. But usually my experience tells me it's something between 9 and 10 liters for this vehicle. And we score equal consumption figures with the 2 liter turbos in those compact hatches, for example. So that's about the autobahn driving. that you still have uh, you know, a normal mid-size vehicle but then sportly tuned so you're also very well in control so it's a little bit easier to drive than um, for example with like a, with a true sports car a little bit you know less nervous I would say and also with the well, with the all-wheel drive really good in control always um, I really like the new system suspension setup so if you ask me what's you know the um, the biggest difference if you compare it pre facelift and now the facelift version the suspension is a 
actually soft comfortable great view here to the Mosul River so it's um, somewhat soft and sporty at the same time and uh, you really you don't, oh, don't have that that often so really really cool now this next hairpin corner at sea shifting down very well cool that is yo <laughs> that's some autogefühl for sure so enjoy those corners with me should be even more fun. I think when we finish this short part, we just turn it around and drive uphill, then you'll also hear something more of the sound. Steering, you know, I've experienced that quite often with Mercedes, is good and really natural. To me, it could be a little bit more progressive that you don't have to steer that much, but that's also, you know, some, I think it's a rather preference, you know, some like to steer a little bit more, some like it a little bit more progressive. What about you? Tell me in the comments. But really great fun vehicle. So and the C43 is indeed my favorite of this lineup because it's sporty, but still you remain a certain comfort, especially when you go with the normal base sport seats. It looks good or it looks sporty, but it's not too much, you know? and still everyday capable with this all-wheel drive. Now I'll turn around and just go up this hill once more again for you. Probably this will be even more fun. Turn it around here with the automatic gearbox, shifting you on the right side. The guy is driving behind me, probably on the hair. What is this guy doing now? <laughs> so, what you would rather have with the C63 is that, you know, the rear end slides out a little bit more. So, that's, you know, for more skilled drivers probably. Um, but then again, for public roads, of course, it doesn't make so much sense because you always have to think about safety. So, this is really a very cool setup that you can have a lot of driving fun but at the same time remain with this rather safe all-wheel drive and good distribution. You have definitely a rear wheel bias, you are more pushed from behind than you're pulled in the front, that's for sure. And I mean you could also, um, you know, with the Sport Plus mode here, already the stability control is drawn back a little bit so you can play around with the car a little bit more. But when I accelerate out of the corners, I still feel that I'm also having a little bit of torque on the front wheels. So it's not, of course, a purest sports car, but so much fun and such a great control. <laughs> and you definitely feel this power upgrade it has received. Now at those 390 horsepower, so it's definitely more powerful than the predecessor, or like the, the pre-facelift version, and also you know the whole tuning of the engine. It's not one of those very new engines yet, so it's rather classic one, so no 48 volt board net, but it still does does really a tremendous job. Wow. This one here is truly a dream mid-size sedan, no doubt. Exterior, a very elegant styling. Well, the rear, I'm more favor with the coupe and the convertible versions for sure. On the interior, a very good build quality. You also get nice sustainable seats from the base setup, if you like. And this new infotainment system layout. It's optional, you do not have to go for it. It's also, again, extra in the price, but 
you know, it's a useful upgrade for sure if you want something more fancy, but still no touchscreen. I think, you know, it's about time and they show that, you know, with the new MBUX, we've seen it in the new Mercedes Sprinter and the new Mercedes A-Class and will also come to the other models um, bit by bit. But here, obviously, you know, the whole system was obviously not ready for it or they didn't want to invest so much money um, in the facelift here. Driving wise, I think it's even a little bit more comfortable than the one before. So the one before was a little bit rougher maybe suspension wise. Here they've tuned this adaptive suspension that it both gives you comfort and also the very sporty ride and it's a very fun ride and a great sound for sure. You don't need an eight cylinder to have a great sound here. The six cylinder does a very good job and it's also not a big problem that it's not hand, handmade by one person. Really does a good job. And considering it is a performance car and performance engine, the consumption is still relatively okay if we compare it also with other vehicles. Price-wise, by the way, standard C-Class starts about 30,000 euros or $30,000. And this one here, C43, about 60. So this one then double the price, gets really expensive. With some more extras, the top infotainment even more, 70 at least, 75. That gets really expensive. So a better price performance here would be a C300 or a C400 then. Maybe get it then with the AMG line for the looks. Then you also get my favorite diamond pin grill still. So that one would be my advice actually. And uh, you know, to have a better price performance ratio and still have a very decent version. Again, if you want it more versatile, check out the estate version. We'll show sure deliver you some more content that's as well. And we also have content on the coupe and the convertible. You can check that out on Autografuel. Too. What do you think about those facelift changes in general about the C43? And now to the comparison conclusion. The Alfa Giulia is still very beautiful and timeless in the design, although they are very late with the introduction of full LED main headlamps. In the interior you meanwhile have a better infotainment system, finally with CarPlay and Android Auto integration. The offering of space is the worst among the competitors especially with a tiny rear space. You have some animal skin alternatives, but not entirely. In driving, the Alfa Giulia is one of the most fun in the segment. The updated steering feels better and is pretty direct. The suspension is a good compromise of sportiness and comfort. The Giulia can be bought with rear-wheel drive or all-wheel drive. The all-new BMW 3 Series made up some serious ground in the interior build quality now. That's good. In this test here, the BMW interior has even the best build quality meanwhile. Since the new generation is also longer now, you can sit better in the rear of the car. Center tech leatherette is available as proper seating choice. Nice also to have the new voice input infotainment system. The BMW 3 Series has the most conservative styling on the exterior. With the M Sport suspension, you can get one of the stiffest rides in this segment from Works. However, if you don't especially want that, we rather recommend saving the money in going for the base suspension or picking the optional adaptive suspension. The driving fun is always very special to the BMW. It accelerates very well out of the corners with either the full rear-wheel drive or the rear-wheel biased all-wheel drive. Remember, you cannot get the 340i as rear-wheel drive everywhere. You can, however, for example, get that one in the Northern American market. In other markets, you have to take a weaker engine for rear-wheel drive only. In general, the handling has been further improved. We were just not 100% happy with the steering wheel feeling in the low degree areas. Was a little better in sports mode though. The Mercedes C-Class has been facelifted some time ago, but not with major changes. On the exterior, the C-Class remains elegant. Most changes happen in the interior with the new infotainment system. However, it is not the new MBUX system with the voice input, which we already know from all new Mercedes models. So you don't have a touchscreen nor the modern voice input. Also, at other details in the interior, you realize that the C-Class is a little dated meanwhile. Furthermore, getting competition from the inside the brand with the A-Class sedan or the all-new CLA, which is even at the same length. The interior seating is a little caged in like in the Giulia, however Mercedes shows the biggest variety of non-animal seating choices from a range of Artico or MB Textile Red and for AMG lines and true AMG models the famous Dynamica Microfiber Artico Mix. In driving, the C-Class offers the widest span across the model lineup, 
ranging from a super soft and comfortable air suspension to the AMG tuned suspension which are way sportier than. So where does it leave us? Go for the BMW 3 Series or the Alpha Giulia, no matter which version, if you appreciate that agile driving out of the corners feeling you get from a rear wheel driven platform or a rear wheel biased all wheel drive and this overall sportier handling. With the C-Class you have to get the AMG version for that sportier experience. The softest ride however you would get from a normal C-Class with the optional air suspension. The BMW 3 Series is optionally the stiffest ride. The interior build quality goes to the BMW 3 Series as well. The seating comfort and seating choices to the Mercedes C-Class without AMG badge. If practicability and space is important to you, the BMW is surprisingly now the best one. Also, there is a big difference in controlling the infotainment, where BMW now offers the natural voice input. And my personal choice? Well, at this moment I'd prefer the Alfa Giulia exterior with the Mercedes C-Class interior design and seating, but with the current MBUX infotainment or the ones from BMW together with the 3 Series drivetrain, since BMW has the best engines in the test and also the best relation of performance and fuel economy. Hmm, so I cannot get exactly what I want? So what do we do? <laughs> Such a tough choice. Emotionally, the Alfa Giulia touches me most when looking at it, no doubt, by far. Even though I appreciate the new BMW 3 Series build quality and the infotainment system, the interior styling and the seating of the Mercedes C-Class is still awesome, especially in the comfort combination with the optional air suspension. So, especially if I have a day where I think about a longer motorway ride, the C-Class it still would be for me. Although it's a very close call, then when I more think about the driving fun and the overall package and how modern and how updated the car is, I think I would end up with the BMW 3 Series, probably even as the new plug-in hybrid version, because that one is combining rear wheel drive so this core of the brand BMW feeling, but together with new technology and it will also be, especially for me in Germany for example, very good as for the taxation. Price and service will also play a role. Let's just imagine one of the dealers is, let's say, way better than the others in service or maybe also in the concise pricing point. So that's definitely also an aspect that could change the things in the end. And of course, What's your preference then? Rather comfort or rather sportiness? This will definitely also play a role. So what's your take?